Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $10 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leading managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day everyone, Clayton here from XY Advisor, chatting with Andrew from Core Data. How are you, mate? Yeah, very well. Excellent, excellent. Um, so we were just having a really brief conversation then about some of the things that you think are important trends in financial services. And uh, I got to say, your answer was probably more in-depth and uh, well-researched than most of the answers I get. So um, at that stage, I was like, wait, hold because we're going to have to start again. Um, So we we spoke about three different things. uh, And so I think the first one um, was, well, actually, probably the last one we're speaking about, but I think had had several arms to it, was the fact that the baby boomers are essentially all but hit drawdown phase, or call it age 55. They're they're in the last part of their savings phase, but it's the smallest part in the life phase. You think about the baby boomers as a curve post-war, which ran from forty-nine to sixty-four. Yep. You've got to remember that all those titles uh, uh, that that exist, baby boomers, Gen Y, Gen X, Gen Z, they're not really good demographic titles. They're mostly psychographic titles, and they weren't really done by researchers. They were mostly done by journalists. Gen X, for example, is a Fair name play. which comes from a man called Douglas Coupland, who is a journalist who wrote a book about it. Yeah, right. Gen Y, Gen Z, same things. They came from journalists. And they're, they're intergenerational titles used to describe behaviours. Baby mm. boomers are a demographic lump because there was literally a baby boom after the war. Now, baby boomers had two other significant advantages over everybody else. First is that um, most of the labour, the skilled labour that they were replacing was killed in the Second World War. So they were able to reprice labour. Wow. And the effect of repricing labor also repriced capital assets. And the most common one of those is your house. So housing got repriced during that time because people could choose to invest in their house and spend on their house and do those types of things. And there's been some beneficial tax treatments of that asset which have made it attractive and made it a great way to store money. So, And Australians in particular are good owners and buyers of houses. Australians, New Zealand, there's not so much in other countries. The really interesting part about that is you're right. The youngest of those, the people who are born in 64, are now turning 55. We've got kind of three months left of those people turning 55. And what we know from all the research we've done over the past 20 years is that 55, savings behaviour starts to change. We call this the sprint to retirement. And so people start to really, really push into retirement and start to think about it. Consumers suffer, most consumers, about 80% of consumers suffer from this thing called temporal dissonance. If a problem is far away, we don't really consider it. But if you're 55, retirement is real. If you're 55, the first parts of your body are breaking down. Remember, most people don't retire because they choose to retire. Most people actually retire for health reasons. That's yeah, the most common right. reason, right? So all of a sudden, you're 55. I'm 55. I'm the youngest of the baby boomers. My back's hurting. <laughs> My knees are hurting. Can't, right. I can't run on cement anymore. I have to run on the soft sand. Mate, you're not slowing down anytime soon. No, I can well, tell. there's, there's a kind of intellectual drive behind that. <laughs> yeah. But all of a sudden, I have to now think about retirement and think about the kind of end of work and what that looks like. This is kind of the last third of your working life. You have your first third where you're building your skills and you're choosing your career and your boss. Your second third where you're really building your career. Mm -hmm. And your last third of your career is you're kind of managing your way out to the next cycle and into retirement. And if you can choose to have that active, you're lucky. But most people, that's a kind of passive event. So all of a sudden, this is a big deal. But if you think about that curve slightly differently, the vast bulk of the baby boomers are probably in their 60s now. So this is very real. The most common birthday in England, for example, this year is 70. So the most commonly occurring birthday. No most, way. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's really interesting. So if you want to make money, invest in birthday cards for 70-year-olds. <laughs> but think about what that does to the economy in terms of what the money's doing. Yeah. So the thing that we've got to think of, if you're a financial planner in Australia now, your skills are going to become really important because there's three things that are going to happen. One is that people are going from 
earning to saving and saving well structurally to the right products, into the right asset classes, etc. That's a skill. Most people don't have it. They need help. The second group, the people who are 65, they've moved into drawdown. Doing that well is really important. And if you're 70, you're starting to think about, well, passing the asset on. And the three big fears of the people passing the asset on is that there's, they've structured it improperly. They give too much money to the government. Yeah. There's an improper distribution. Someone who they don't like or don't understand well gets the money. Yeah. They shouldn't have the money or they get a lump sum and it's really dumb to give person X or person Y a lump sum. And the third one is that an improper purchase is made is that someone buys a Ferrari and sticks it in the driveway of their flat <laughs> instead of buying the flat and sticking the turtle crawler How in the dare driveway. you call a Ferrari an improper purchase? Well, as a, as a lover of German cars, <laughs> um, I Fair don't see enough. the Italians as great. Although the <laughs> Italian designs of the 1960s, particularly the early Ferraris, were absolutely beautiful. <laughs> but uh, I think they lost their way in the 80s. The Magnum PI Ferrari was possibly the last great car. <laughs> Mate. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I got to dive into why you understand this so well. So and uh, so you used to work at uh, AMP. You're now CEO um, at Core Data, and all this stuff it's just rattling off your. So let me tell you a little bit about the the kind of my background. I started yeah. out um, wanting to write about economics. I love economics. I love right. behavioral economics. I I, I, I act in consider myself a behavioral economist right that, that title is as meaningful as the title juggler or magician it's not a particularly powerful it's kind of a group noun which is not particularly powerful but i'm really into it right i've done a lot of research uh, and i read about it it's not just my job but my hobby well i started core data 20 years ago next february wow yeah and so what core data does is it tries to understand the gap between the consumer needs and yep. the manufacturer's needs Right. So that's our whole job. Our whole job is to look, understand the difference between those two things. Because for a long time, I walk, when I worked at AMP, I spent um, sort of a decade there in marketing and product management and those things. And it was an odd place for an economist to be, but yeah. uh, 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 I, I quite enjoyed it. I was completely aware that we really had no clue of what the customer wanted or was doing. We were simply making things, throwing them over the wall and see what we could sell. Seeing what sticks. Yeah. And so... Literally, it costs um, about $100,000 a time to build a product, and we would be doing about eight or ten a year and just throwing them with all. Some would work, some would. Yeah, Chaos, right. right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think things have improved somewhat since then. <laughs> I certainly hope they have. But the kind of interesting thing is that it, I, I constantly understood that the customer was very opaque to the manufacturer. Right. The moment that I walked through the doors of 33 Alfred Street, which is the circular key building, the rest of the world ceased to exist, and AMP only thought about itself rather than about the customer needs. Right. I think those things have changed, but that's, yes. that's for every. I worked prior to that. I did four years at Rothschild Asset Management yeah, right. and, the, and working in a much more technical role. But the, the point was that this, the same things are true. So I really wanted to understand this from the customer's perspective. So that's our entire job. I'm by nature a big data guy. So I, I, we built inside Core Data, not just the research skills. And we were kind of first to get on the cloud, first to understand all those things and first to move into that space. Everyone's since followed us there, but we're ahead of them in some other ways. But we built up a big database. Yeah, right. 151,000 mass affluent and high net worth Australians in our database. How, uh, uh, like how? What's the methodology? Well, we've built an online magazine. Right. Called Hunter and Bly. Yeah, so right. we can constantly stimulate them through that. And so we give away um, every quarter a prize, travel prizes generally, or alcohol prizes, and we yeah. write about that. So it's hunterandbly.com.au. Cool. And that builds a live networking community. The second thing is that we have, via the research that we've done, a big database of financial professionals in Australia, about 24,000 financial planners, 10,000 accountants, similar number of mortgage brokers. Whoa. And again, we're constantly stimulating them and talking with them. And we have an online magazine called New Model Advisor where we publish our research. Yes. So our entire goal is to understand consumers and help financial services businesses grow. Wow. So that's our, our, our gig, right? It's to be growth partners for financial services businesses. Yeah. And growth can mean a bunch of things. It can mean... Um, increased profits it yep. can mean increased customer numbers um or, or or it can mean increased customer satisfaction the the powerful word in our kind of motto which is growth partnerships uh, is important because growth is full of meaning you describe growth and we describe what partnership is how we help if we don't help you achieve that you sack us that's it gone thanks very much see you later that's a very very interesting uh job you've created for yourself yeah look 
it was it was a it was a kind of a burning need, and I could see it when I was at AMP. And when I started the business, my first customer was AMP. <laughs> yeah. So so we have a constant feed of data from surveys, constant feed of data from mystery shopping. We sent, we push people through the process of buying financial services all the time. Wait, financial services as in uh, you get people to go to financial planners? Yeah. Wow. So you so ASIC does mystery shopping. Yeah. But you guys do mystery shopping. We don't shopping do the well. ASIC mystery shopping. Ours is different because we think we think slightly differently about it. I'm very much admire ASIC's mystery shopping because they can pull the plan at the back end. We can only ask the customers for it. And, Certainly. And um and they often provide it to us and we don't judge it in the same way as they do because um Markets, you have to view with a kind of longitudinal lens. So, if it's, you know, this kind of debate, whether it's the right advice or the wrong advice or whether yeah. it's perfect or not, yeah. it, it's kind of, it is kind of, it is inferential research. We need to have a look at how much they're being charged, what they're being charged for, do they understand what they're being charged for, yeah. and then whether or not the asset allocation is right, it's kind of ducks and drakes, right? You can, you can argue with intolerance is what's good or bad about that. Obviously, if there's something wrong, and you totally. can, can clearly see it. But we do about 130 of those a year. Wow. So in the financial advice sector. I had no idea. Yeah. And, and also in the private banking sector as wow. well. Wow. Yeah, Wait, do ba- you guys pay for that? We pay the consumer yes. to do it. Yeah. And then we, uh, then we aggregate the data and sell the research. Okay. So even if it costs, say, someone... You know, if, especially in private banking, right? If someone's paying ten thousand dollars for a piece of advice, you guys wear that? No. So okay. this is really interesting. So the, so it depends. The, the answer is it depends. Right. Um, it, it would rarely cost that sort of money for, sure. for for those sort of people. But what we do is we go to our database and find people who are actually looking for the service. So someone who's really wants to buy ah, it, right? So understood. we go to one hundred and fifty thousand people, right, and say. Hey, if you're getting advice, why don't you get pa- paid to do it? Get right? paid to do it. Oh, that's a pretty good model. You learn about fifteen hundred dollars from us if you do it, right? Fantastic. Uh, so, if we're doing, let's at the moment we're doing one hundred and twenty. So that's going to cost us about two hundred thousand dollars. Goodness gracious! Yeah, to to actually do all the research, and then there's the cost of running the research and doing. Yeah, those, of course. All those I, types of things. I consulted at um, advisor ratings just on the marketing side, but seeing the the data people working, I know it was a bloody a lot of work. Really smart people working yeah, very look, long hours. They're, they're, I mean, they've they've got a big hill in front of them. They don't yet have the database. They, I mean, so whereas we've spent the last twenty years building that database, yeah, no. and we've got twenty years of linear data. It's all in, the, yeah. in our data lake. Oh, the, the longitudinal is that? Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we've got yeah. long, we've got the we've got twenty years of research in a giant data lake. Christ Almighty! So uh, even now, when people say we need to do some research, then we well, you don't really need to do the research. We've, we've, <laughs> we've got we did this in April, right? So. Yeah, man, that's super interesting. So, uh, um, one of the things that we were speaking about before we turn the mics on, and I think we definitely need to speak about it, is. Uh, is the fact that as the big end of town have left advice, you've got a bunch of people that are now unadvised, but they're unaware that yeah, they're unadvised. Yeah, this, this, kind of, this, this has happened in two areas. It's happened in advice and it also inside insurance. There's people inside superannuation, particularly where the compulsory insurances have been turned off and the multiple insurances have been turned off. And the, the insurance companies, the superannuation companies have done everything they can in terms of writing to people and contacting them and saying... Because I'm, I'm in the business of understanding this, for example. I've got multiple superannuation accounts because I want to see what they're doing, how they're communicating, wow, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, interesting. So I run industry funds, I run retail funds, and I run uh, all the neo businesses I've got, I've got relationships with because I want to see how they communicate with me. Totally. And then I can benchmark them and then I can see what's going on. Awesome. So, of course, they wrote to me and said, we're turning off your insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And I observed how, how it did and I made some choices and, and did my insurances. But I was also really clear of going out to our network and saying, have you been communicated with? And they say, no, no, I haven't heard from anyone. And we know that's not true, right? Yeah. Because we could know in that database, well, person X is with Australian Super, and I've seen the Australian Super letters. I know they've gone out. So they haven't read it or whatever. Um, and so they don't know that they're not insured anymore. Um, and that's really problematic. It's more interesting and challenging, not just in the Australian insurance, Australian Super insurance, well, where they where they have the, kind of the blancmange of all Australians, but in businesses like CBUS or Mind Super, where people are in dangerous industries, 
where people yeah. commonly have injuries. Things like Club Plus or Host Plus where people cut their hands and et yeah. cetera, et cetera. And people, kitchen workers. So those guys should be insured. And they should have, they did in the end up getting a carve out. But understanding what those insurances are and how they act is really important to those businesses. Yeah. So the second part of that is that, as you know, BT advice has gone, parts of CBA are closing down, other businesses are shutting down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they're, of course, communicating with their, um, the, with, with the, their advised customers as, as well as they can. Uh, either by phone or by letter and telling them that they're no longer advised. But that's not a perfect process. And the really interesting part about that, and I'm not going to name the company because it's slightly unfair, is that I was a customer of one of those companies that closed down. And the guy who was my advisor simply rang up and said, you've probably heard that we're shutting down. I don't know what this means. I may be moving to company X or company Y, or I may not. And that was the last I ever heard of him. This is your actual financial plan. My actual financial plan. Had to give you that call. Gave me that call and has no and no one has communicated with me. They've still got my money. I don't know who's managing it, how it's being managed. Stop it. No. Holy damn. So, so I'm a previously advised customer of Bank X. Yes. With X dollars in there. Not yes. an insubstantial sum because I'm yes. kind of an old guy. <laughs> um and I'm going to have to figure out where this is going. And how many of these people like yourself do you think are out there? About half a million. Half a million. Yeah. So uh, from an advisor point of view, they're listening going, okay, so you're telling me that there are half a million people that have uh, that are used to having a financial planner that now no longer have a financial planner. Yeah, no, I've gone and found one and it's a painful process. Sure, but you have, but the no. majority of people aren't. Exactly. So... Here's the money question. How do advisors find those 500,000 so people? The really interesting challenge is that there's not actually an easy way to do it because the businesses don't have a good plan for this. And there's some of this is naturally occurring, right? Say you're A&P, you've got people retiring all the time. So those people go into a pool and they should be allocated out, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And all the banks are the same choice. Two of the banks have shut their practices down. One of the banks has change the ownership structure of who who it's gone to so it's now owned by somebody else yep. all of that means flux and change and communication to that flux and change is really important now if you're poorly communicated with and there's a lot of people who are very poorly communicated with me you start to think well i'm going somewhere else mm. so now i have to choose someone so there's a really piece of interest interesting piece that we're doing now and the mystery shopping that we're doing now is showing that people aren't actually easy to choose consumers are concerned about the future they're very worried about the future they're not a blank slate. They're not what the psychologists would call a tabula rasa. They actually come to this with ideas. They come to it with a history of a poor experience. This is not good. They're transferring some of that threat and fear onto the new advisor. And they're looking for, in the main, a fair amount of handholding in the first meeting. At the moment, it's difficult to make appointments. People are busy. They're getting, it's taking up to two weeks to actually get face to face with people. Yeah. Which is, you don't feel particularly loved if you're asking a girl for a date and she says, yeah, I can see you in November. <laughs> Not totally. joking. People are trying to make appointments this week and being told we can't see you until November 14. Yeah, crazy. And everyone's going, well, forget it. I'm yeah. going to find someone else. And especially if, like you say, in, in the situation you were in before you found another advisor, it's like, well, I'd like to talk to you, but I can't even talk to you. You know, from the advisor's point of view, right? Um, and from the client's point of view, it's, well, where do I book my meeting if I can't even get if you don't even if you don't know where you're going then i certainly don't know where you're so, going so yeah and the thinking is you know did i want to stay with the person the advisor that i was with i probably did because he knew the history and he was actually reasonably good to, to deal with the person i really wanted to stay with was his office manager who was fantastic he'd ring her up he'd say i need to do a b c and d yeah she would do it she'd send you a note it's done fantastic this is the person who was actually changing my life i tell you what would be a really good marketing effort would be to promote yourself as the new home for former uh, clients of the big banks. Yeah, there's a really interesting challenge in that because then the range is so diverse. And so if you would take even Westpac, for example, a business that I really liked in history, yep. both their private banking advice has disappeared mm. and their BT advice has disappeared. Some yeah. of it's gone to Viridian, but a lot of it's gone kind of nowhere. That's so nuts. It's interesting, isn't it? Imagine if that was a lease or a mortgage. Or just any any professional service, any, yeah. any group of clients in and any field. It strikes me that ASIC was shocked by that, that there wasn't a plan for these people. That they were like, what do you mean there's no plan? 
yeah maybe that maybe that's not the case maybe this is what they but i mean for a bunch of these people they the advice is really important so so let's be really clear a lot of our research shows that advice adds value and we can really give you the proofs on advice having uh, adding value and we think the advice as alpha is mostly about comfort and planning and doing all those types of things but mathematically it looks like to us it's about three percent compounding a year do you have some sort of research on yeah, that do you have we, a, like a document someone yeah, can download yeah, to have yeah, a look yeah. at that well it's it's owned by other people sure. because they've paid us to do the research. So, so it's for not example, our data. Uh, Russell, I know, has their value of advice and they've got their... Are you so involved Vanguard in that? Vanguard uh, advises Alpha. Yes. Russell yes. has it. So we've done the, the work for the Vanguard in the US. Right. So we're, we're not just Australia. We're US, UK, uh, Australia and, and Asia. Jesus Christ. <laughs> How did I score this interview? <laughs> <laughs> you rang up and asked. Um, uh, and we're just around the corner. Um, uh, so so we're doing that around the world national australia bank is doing a lot of work in that space they understand it really well and they're understanding how to sort of make their offer so that they provide the most value to the most clients and that, that that's on a spectrum so if you think of everyone from your my super client someone who has the most basic needs mm-hmm. to someone who has really complex needs which is structural intergenerational and otherwise and you've got to be yeah. able to meet them in each of those areas and that's really important um, another thing that we spoke about previously and I thought was really interesting um, is trust in advice, yeah. right, before and after Royal Commission and how it's uh, slowly, but actually, no, you didn't say slowly, how it's rapidly getting back to it. So can, can we cover what it was like before the Royal Commission, yeah. then after, and then where it's going? So trust is a complex psychological phenomenon which only exists in humans. So it exists in kind of two right. parts of your brain. We're the only animal which, which actually stores up behavior, which is what trust N- is. Not right? even the other great apes? No. Uh, uh, they all work in dominance hierarchies. Ah. Oh. So you've got to understand dominance hierarchies and trusts are really different. Right. So they don't work the same. And we're the only animal that has it. And, it, and we can take a picture of where trust lives. And it lives in your prefrontal cortex. So we're the only animal with a prefrontal cortex. Understood, yeah. So every action which passes through your brain passes through the prefrontal cortex. And that attaches an emotion to the action. Yes. And it also stores it up. We're the, also the an, only animal which really does a thing called revenge, which is, the, uh, which, is the, uh, which is the dark side of trust, right? Come on. Surely other animals get no, revenge. they don't do revenge. They don't store up behavior. Uh, uh, they have a dominance hierarchy, but not stored behavior. And it lives in a part of your brain called the cardate nucleus, which is a little almond shine shape. Yeah, I'm lab. definitely not going to argue, considering you know where it's stored. In there, well, right? so, so understanding this is really important. And tr- yeah. the trust construct is... is pretty pretty easy to understand there's 200 years of research on this wow so the, the first thing that you need to think of is that the most powerful driver of trust is a thing called benevolence which is is this person acting in my best interest right do they yeah. act for me then there's the thing called authenticity are they who they say they are then there's okay. predictability how does this person behave under pressure oh okay so it's not just they say they well, they did they what they said they were going to do. It's under, under adverse pressure. environments. Yeah, under adverse right. environments, how are they going to act? Do they go to water? Do they all those types of things? Right. So, understanding the kind of the kind of algorithmic nature of trust, which is really important to understand. So, you've got to meet those things all the time. So, you've got to be benevolent. You've got to be competent. You've got to be able to do what you say you're going to do. Mm-hmm. And often, confidence and competence are mistaken for each other. Very confident people. It's like a shortcut to competence, but it's not always true particularly in men. Men are more confident than they're often. Yeah, risk takers, right? Well, they figure I can solve this. Yeah. So, you know, I'll fix this. Give them, you know, um, and then there's authenticity and, and, and predictability. And they're the sort of drivers. And then there's self-interest. Yep. So self-interest is a really big driver. And then there's a kind of time factor. So we understand trust research really well. And we've done a lot of work and kind of academic work in this space. So we've built a series of models and what you're always trying to do is take kind of an algorithmic structure and generate a number an integer for this a simple number so it's kind of a long questionnaire but it gives you a reliable trust indicator so we do that for government for mortgage brokers for real estate for accountants for financial planners etc etc right so because you guys understand this concept of trust so well your the the quality of your research is therefore high yeah look uh, everyone thinks that's it's kind of amazing but I, I, i'm confident in saying to people this is not our idea right we didn't invent this oh understood yeah, yeah so yeah. you know 
this has been done in the 1950s brilliantly in America. But at least you're that, aware Germany. of that framework and you're yeah. using that so, framework yeah. rather than just pulling questions out of thin no, air. No, no, exactly. And so yeah. that's, so I presented it recently and a guy came up to me and said, a, a, a whole survey, and a guy came up to me and said, you should patent this. And I said, mate, this was done by Walter <laughs> Mitchell in, in 1950. It's not, it's not my idea, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so, uh, so you should still do it. I can't. It's some, <laughs> literally someone else's idea. And anybody who knows anything about this will recognize the author of this survey as this guy from America. <laughs> right. So I just repeated the survey. And there's better work done by Philip Zimbio and, and the guys who did the Stanford prison experiment oh, and all yeah, those wow. kind of things. Yeah, so under understanding that, you know, and the work that Stanley Milgram and didn't they're all much better than me. I'm sort of just standing on their feet, right? When, and ta- and yeah. taking. But repeating the work is important. So prior to the Royal Commission, we, like everybody else, saw the Royal Commission coming. This is coming, right? We've failed to self-regulate. You can't get away from this now. There's too many bodies in the street. Um, this, this is going to happen. So we started doing a quarterly trust survey in a whole bunch of sectors of the Australian market. If you want a copy of the research, I'll, I'll give you a copy of the output data and you can circulate it to anyone. That'd be amazing. Yep. So if we break it up in segments, so what happens is that we started to look at this. And prior to the Royal Commission, uh, financial planning, banking and superannuation had very high trust scores. Superannuation is the highest so the 0.75 or 75%. Banking was uh, was about 0.66 and financial planning about 0.6. So if you understand that as kind of zero to 10 being the kind of trust score ratios, no one ever has a perfect 10, but plenty of people have zero or negative numbers. Oh. But, yeah, it's an interesting way to understand it. Um, a six out of 10 is really good. That's a fantastic number. So financial planning was in good shape. Okay, so six out of ten is considered standard. It's like an NPS score, right? It's not, right. I think it's so, so, so at six, that's fine. It's, yeah. it's trusted. Yeah. The moment of the Royal Commission, it went to point three to three. Right. Which is really bad, right? right? Everyone's a detractor. No one wants to be with you. Right. Since that time, it's been steadily recovering. So banking went down from uh, sort of six to three, and is back to about five. Uh, financial planning's back at point four one. Okay. So it's recovering quite rapidly. And at the current rate, if it keeps carrying at the current quarterly rate, it'll be back to 0.6 within another year. So it'll have completely recovered. Yeah, right. So it's a really interesting thing which is going on, partly because people realised that it was overdone uh, and partly that there have been some substantial changes in the marketplace. Uh, wh- one of the things, so the, I think the full name was the Royal Commission into Banking and financial services misconduct. That's I right. I think that yeah. was the full yeah. name. That's right. And uh, the thing that really annoyed me about what ended up happening is you had the close of the Royal Commission, bank stocks go up, and then essentially uh, somehow, not even somehow, almost predictably, uh, all the, call it the shit, landed at the feet of financial planners, well, which I thought the... was super unfair. Well, it, it... Markets, there's a kind of interesting understanding of the way in which market works. You can either, either accept a perfect market hypothesis or reject it, right? But there are some people at the moment who are rejecting the pricing of Australian financial services stocks at their low levels. Those people who are rejecting it aren't in Australia. They're in the US, the UK and Asia. They're the ones buying the stocks because right. they think that they've been oversold. They think, because I've been to see these guys, they think they're as much as 40% mispriced. And they think if they invest now, they're going to have a 40% price reversion to what, what the price should be. Interesting. Okay. So you're, you're, basically what you're saying is just because there was an effect, that the, an, an immediate effect directly after the closing of the Royal Commission, it doesn't necessarily reflect sentiment. It reflects international, say, technical trading well, analysts. no, there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, so if you take the UK example, they had RDR ahead of us and yes. they had pension mis-selling and a whole bunch of other mis-selling scandals and the prices yes. and the businesses there got absolutely smashed. Yes. They halved in value overnight. The, they will have repriced to where they should be, where, where they should be in terms of an earnings multiple and a future earnings multiple probably by this year. So it's going to take about five years. So the Americans and the Europeans think the same thing will happen in Australia. Touche. The listed stocks will return to their proper value, or they'll take this kind of fear discount off them, which is what this is, um, and they will be properly priced. Now, if you can get a 40% uplift over four to five years in a really low inflation market environment where not many stocks will be doing that. Blue chip as well. Yeah, that's a really good chance of actually repricing. 
That's a good point. So I know now people who own financial services businesses who are getting approaches from businesses overseas saying we'll pay 10 times. 10 times what? 10 times current earnings. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is this, are you, is this is non-listed? Non-listed. Okay. Private equity deal. That's, yeah. And are they saying sure? No. Oh. The ones that I know are doing it saying we'd like to talk to you. And I'm not going to break any confidence. No, no, I know no, these of people course. really well. We're, not, we're actually in acquisition stage because we just bought a business for 1.2 times. <laughs> yeah, right. And we're buying other businesses for one times and we're in a growth path at this stage. So why don't you come and see us in 2025 when we've hit our, our growth? Fall? This is fantastic because uh, from an advisor's point of view, there's a lot of bad sentiment in the market. And what's interesting is to hear about all the other stakeholders in the ecosystem are actually bullish and it makes sense well, this is not true for everyone right okay so if you want to sit down and think about australian financial services com- companies and do what carl linnaeus did in the 1600s and divide them up into segments and so you know how he did the kingdom phylum all and genus species one we divided them up into foxes oxes islanders and cruisers a fox is a well-run small business mostly on the cloud good business plans good succession planning good growth plans Mm. Um, really clear cl- charging structures, engage clients, but, but little and growing fast. An ox business is the same, but tends to have up to 20 ARs and probably six partners. Where the tension in those businesses, they tend to have some young partners and some old partners. Young partners are trying to drive value into the business. Old partners are trying to drive value out of the business. But they're really well-run professional businesses. Those are the ones that are attracting the buyers. An islander tends to be a person who's, li- who's by themselves, who really wants one product, probably came from a life insurance background, um, isn't really compliant, really makes most of its money from its rebus baits from its product managers uh, and, you know, exists on that. So if you, if you took the AMP example, there's a couple of two big payments they might get a year, one of 200,000, one of 50,000. That's really the profit that they're getting out of their business. That's what they're pulling out for themselves. Yes. And that's gone, right? That income is gone in the future. Yeah. Cruises are the same. Cruises we noted when we were doing the research are people who not sure how to think about this who tend to work two to three days a week i met a guy Uh, yesterday who um is running a practice loves golf loves golf up in the central coast this guy in particular (laughs) loves surfing cool so it doesn't work monday doesn't work friday legend yeah legend having a great time lives on acreage uh, Uh, north of newcastle stop it yeah right great time (laughs) beautiful car yeah he and his wife work in the business they work tuesday wednesday thursday um uh, um but they charge Monday to Friday, right? That's what they're charging their client for. And the client has that expectation. Understood. And they yeah. do 60, a hol- 60 days of holidays overseas a year. The yeah. islanders and the cruisers who are living on those businesses, and they're not necessarily bad financial planners, yes. but they're not doing what they say they should be doing. Understood, yeah. And they're the people that will be driven out of the, biz- out of the market. Those businesses have no value. Right. They literally have, will be being sold for one times earnings, and they'll only ever be sold for one times earnings. Because when we do the research on their client engagement research, which we do, Every year, there's no engagement. Right. There's a small number that they're close to, but the vast bulk of them, no idea. No idea. Well, you know, uh, which is which is a shame. So they won't make have those attractive multiples being paid to them. But the people who are, the guy I spoke to had a ten times earnings has got a really tight business and is growing really well. His wow. clients really love him. They understand the offer. He only charges them a fee for service. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah, no yeah. The platform fee and a fee for service, and that's it. So I know a few advisors that do this that um yeah we just call it sort of the the new evolution of advice right so uh the advisors sort of see it as any product cost is uh is almost like it's almost their responsibility to reduce product cost as much as possible um and then you can even just at the the first year of advice say hey look this is how much we've reduced for you in ongoing product costs um, don't receive any commission, whether investment, super, or even insurance. Just charge flat fee for service. Um, and so, are you saying that those businesses that do that have a higher value Much higher multiple. multiple? Yeah. Hey, that's really good news. See, I, did, I had no idea about that. Well, I mean, it's it's simply from the buyer's perspective because they find that easy to understand. They know it's compliant, and they understand the future of those businesses really clearly. And I've been thinking a lot about this actually, um, as to why at why is it that advisors find it easier to tell someone 
that they have, say, a $10,000 product fee than it is for advisors to say you have a $5,000 product fee and a $5,000 advice fee. I, I just, it's, I've been thinking about it more and more and more. And it's almost like uh, advisors were trained to say or to feel that by, by saying you're, you're personally not receiving the money but some other company is, yeah, that it's it, easier. But I, I actually don't think it is. I think you need to think about this and I think you're thinking about this the right way, but if you think about this in a couple of ways, there's a lot of people that came into the advice industry from a sales and product background. So those people find it easy to articulate product benefit, whereas people who come into it from a structural background, maybe they were an ex-account, maybe they're an ex-banker, maybe whatever, they actually under, want to understand this from a skills, behavioral background. Yeah. So where people add the greatest value, and the greatest value of research really always comes out to people get higher peace of mind if they understand their future. They don't have to necessarily be rich. They need to understand what the future looks like. And that's what the advisor really does for them. That's what people are really paying for. So there's generally a big upfront cost to that because it takes a lot of time to get the plan right. But then there's a low ongoing cost. Now our cycle shows that that resets every three years, that there is effectively a big cost every three years. Uh, so are, you're, are you saying... As, as a general rule, advisors should be uh, re-examining a plan every three years. Deeply every three years. Really? Lightly every quarter. Interesting, because whenever I think of sort of like a 10-year roadmap, I think, okay, uh, Andrew, you're my client and we're going to do this, 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 and this over the next decade. Um, but you're saying maybe it's we're going to do this, this, this. At this point, things will have changed. So we did an experiment two years ago. Uh, where we got people to, we looked at the survivability bias inside um, client books, um, and then we went to the, the we had a look at our 19-year piece of linear data. It was uh, sorry, 16 years in that time, and had a look at the refresh and change rate inside people's lives. And it tends to be every three years. Literally, if you have to talk to a customer and come in after three years of engaging and say, "Hey, we really need to talk. Things have changed," the customer in 80% of times will say, "Yeah, things have changed. We do need to talk." Wow. So. That sort of shortcut that's in some licensees that says, just ask the question, has your uh, situation changed in the last 12 months as a part of an annual review? And, you know, 90% of the time they just tick no, so they don't have to do anything. You're suggesting that that's probably very incorrect. Well, on a 12-month cycle, things don't change significantly. But if you think about someone who goes from that sort of 35-year-old to the 55-year-old, Let's say they have kids who enter school when they're 35. So they tend to do primary school, which is not a particularly expensive period of time. High school's expensive. So we need to talk about that, right? We need to talk about that. And that could be a 12-year cycle if you've got three kids where you actually have to manage the cost of raising those kids. Then they go to the university stage and that's less expensive, but the needs are slightly different. And then let's say they go the post-university stage. And one of the things that happens when people are post-university is that people get a lot of income back because they're not paying for the kids anymore. The kids are earning their own money. Right. So big cost phase, low cost phase. So unless you've got a good advisor, you might spend that new income. You should be saving that. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. you should be saying, well, okay, um, your children are out of university now. You're literally getting, let's say it's three kids, you're getting $28,000 in the hand back now that you were previously spending on the kids. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to put that in super? That's a great place for some of it. Are we going to be buying other investments? That's a great place for some of it. The 1980s Ferrari? Well, look, um, <laughs> I, I'm a Porsche man. Uh, and, That's like German, yeah. Yeah, uh, I like the 1987 wide-bodied 3.2-litre um, horizontally opposed air-cooled <laughs> six-cylinder. That's I, like to, um, I like to bash my knuckles on it. Awesome. But I also know I've got a few investments. Pound for pound, that has been my most successful investment. <laughs> that has been my Macquarie Bank of Investments. I bought it for X thousand dollars, and it's tripled in value. No. Absolutely. That is... In the time that I held it. To the point so where I'm thinking cool. about selling it because I was like, if someone's going to give me that much for it, they can have it. Oh, man. I've never, I've never heard such an appreciating asset be uh, appreciated so much. Well, I like driving it, but I'd also like to have the money that it's worth. <laughs> yeah, fair play. So, you know, they just don't make those cars anymore. And I also, I was having this conversation with a friend. I think I'm the last generation that appreciates it. The generation behind me doesn't care about old oily Porsches. No. So, uh, so I'm 36 and, um, 
And my first car was a 1970-something Toyota Corona. And uh, I started... The butter box? The, uh, well, I never called it that, but it was very boxy looking. Yeah, yeah, that was called the butter box. <laughs> oh, was it? There yeah. you go. The 180, 1.8 liter. I mean, I know my car. Well. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Uh, it was aqua as well. It was crazy. Uh, <laughs> man. Uh, it's Nippon Blue. Uh, oh, it, actually, that was the name of it. Yeah, that's the color. Oh, my God. I know all this stuff, man. I'm Dude, a weirdo. That is <laughs> awesome. Um, so uh, so I um, moved to Sydney like about eight years ago, and all I had at the time was a motorbike. Um, also, I was single. So, you know, you have a motorbike. Motorbikes are fantastic, you, mate. You've yeah. got to have at least three in your life. <laughs> that's a good point. And then um, uh, I met uh, Vera down here. We've since married. And, uh, and for the last handful of years, I've just had no vehicle, right? So uh, I live sort of in the city, but you're definitely right in that um, car ownership and sort of owning things, I think is probably one of the big differences between the, you call it a psychographic, between yeah. uh, baby boomers and and I, I, I dare call myself a millennial because, you know, I'm technically in those barriers, but... Um, you know, I'm wearing something rather flan- flannelly today, which is rather Gen X-y. Um, but yeah, so we're after experiences. Uh, you know, the baby boomers are more more likely to be in um, in ownership. So I, lo- I, I love my cars, right? I'm a car guy. I grew up on a farm in rural Victoria. I got my first car when I was 11. Ah. Morris 1100, 1964 porcelain green horizontally opposed engine. It's a great car. <laughs> I was the first thing I did was just pull the engine out and rebuild it. Dude, that is so awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could I could rebuild that engine, the Holden 186 and the 20, Holden 202 and possibly the VW engine blindfolded because I've rebuilt them so many times. Oh. Literally know where everything is. But, my God. But the new cars, you open up the bonnet and there's a plastic sheet over it which says in German, don't touch this. Yeah. So um, And the Tesla as well, right? There's basically, you've got two axles and a battery. Fun to drive. But in the last two trips, I recently had to do a trip to Canada for work and I hired a five litre V8 2018 oh, Mustang. Stop it. Mentalist. It was a ridiculous <laughs> car. It was. Abs- it came with a dragway setting. <laughs> what does that even mean? It means you can lock up the front brakes, get the back wheels to spin, and, re- and press a button, and it really launches. Are they they let people hire these. Yeah. So do you have if, to do a driving test to prove? What's you- even funnier is that I get to I get to to um, Canada and I'm renting it right. So I'm just talking to the guy and he said, "Oh, you're the last person to rent this car." I said, "What does that mean?" He said, "Oh, it's a turn back car. After you rent it, we rebuild it and sell it." And I'm looking at this guy, he's called Richard, and he said, should I sell you the full insurance? I said, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should sell me the full insurance. You shouldn't have told me that. <laughs> uh, so I flogged this thing. Well, I went into the distant backwards of Canada and just saw how fast I could make this thing go. How, how fast did you go? Well, I, I, I've kind of ran out of nerves at about 200 k's an hour. It wasn't actually very well balanced. I was on this thing called the Sea to Sky Highway in a Porsche... Nine, uh, 987 passed me and I thought right I'm going to have you so I pulled out to chase him couldn't get anywhere near him because Whoa, I just couldn't hold the curves yeah. but last two weeks ago I went to a conference in Japan yeah. in Japan I rented a 1987 R32 Skyline oh yes 180 k's in third gear Oh, damn what's even more interesting is the Japanese police seem not really to care about speeding what do you mean? so I'm in Going with the traffic under a tunnel, there's tunnels everywhere on the road to Mount Fuji. Right. It's doing 140, it's marked 80, but I'm just <laughs> keeping up with the traffic. And a policeman comes drifting past me, uh, doing about 160. Didn't even pay any attention to me. And I eventually spoke to, because I'm quite a history guy, right? So I get yeah. a guide in every city. And oh, I, Matt. I spoke to the local guide and said, What's going on with the car laws? And he said, Oh, yeah, speeding's not really a thing here. We don't really care about it. <laughs> if it's stolen or something like that, we really care about it. But, uh, you know, it's kind of whatever. So there's all these toll booths all through the way through Japan because there's lots of toll booths. So I turned every toll booth into a Grand Prix star. So how fast <laughs> I could get to 200 k. Mate, that is so cool. So I tried to drift it, but I couldn't until I got back. And then someone pointed out, you had the, because they're four wheel drive. And, and they said, you have to turn that off. I'm like, oh, right. Yeah, well, I missed that one. Mate, that is so cool. So um, do you do any work specifically uh, with advice and advisors, or is it all mostly we do. product? No. Okay. So, um, uh, so we do. We, we focus on sort of big customer insights. But over the past four or five years, we've been working with advice businesses kind of intimately, building their offer, building their structure, building their pricing models, and doing as like a consulting. Yeah, often? kind of as a consulting, often right. for the licensee. 
Um, oh, okay, that and, makes more sense. And, and doing it at that level and, and working there, but occasionally with businesses, we're really open to it. Yeah, and cool. We really get involved and get kind of deep into it. There are better businesses than us than doing it. We work at a structural level because I'll, I'll be candid. Mm. Writing the business plan is one thing. But it's the discipline of following it, which is the gritty, grindy yes. part, which makes the real difference. And someone has to be there every day doing that. Yeah. So, for example, inside Core Data, we've got the 100-day fitness challenge. If you do a half an hour's exercise and you have to take a photograph of yourself doing it. Um, uh, really? Uh, yeah. And just post it to this chat group that we've got. Huh. Uh, and it, and um uh, we'll reward you. There'll be sort of economic rewards inside the company. If you do half an hour's exercise a day, we'll pay you a bit more money. That's crazy. Are you saying this is your employees? Yeah. Oh, you've got your own little, uh, what is it, AIA Vitality going on. Kind of, right? <laughs> uh, and the, so there's six people who have signed up for it. Yeah, cool. We're in week three. Yeah. Um, and if uh, and you have to, there's a cup, to, the challenge is that there's probably twice a week you have to do two a day. Um, the people who are doing it in week three have already found substantial physical and mental changes. Oh, that's awesome. It's quite interesting. And who knew? But the challenge is it's keeping it going, right? Keeping yes. it up, keeping yes. it happening. Yeah. So we all know to lose weight, we've got to eat less and exercise more. Yes. Half an hour is really an hour, really, of exercise every day. Whoa. Fundamentally changes your life. Yeah. And, and But it's grindy, right? You're hung over. Like, oh man! Went to a conference into, in the Southern Highlands this week. Yeah, <laughs> drank too much champagne. Ugh. Well, free champagne. And, yeah. Um, what oh, are no. you going to do? But oh, no. I woke up at five fifteen and thought, "Well, I've got to do it because I've got to take a picture of me doing it." And I'm the boss, right? Oh no! So that that hour of exercise is brutal. Oh. But I did it and I felt great. So. Do, you, do you do you guys have like uh, wrist things that track? Some of the that? guys do. I yeah. tend not to. I just say so. I live in a place which is close to a beach, and two laps of the beach is three point two kilometers. So. Yeah. You run that, 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, 100 squats, then around the boys for a swim and back in. That's a solid hour, right? And I try and do that every morning. Oh, man. So, but, you know, and take a photo. Here I am doing it. And yeah. uh, uh, this is, so I was taking a photo of the location. Everyone's going, yeah, but you might. So then I took a photo of myself covered in sweat. And they said, yeah, don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's too much information. Yeah, exactly. So you don't want to see that. But, but so, so you do similar things for, uh, so you put challenges to financial planners, do you? Yeah. Well, so we go in and we work with them and understanding their structure, how much. They're, so we look, so the first thing we do is look, we look at their customer book and get a really good understanding of that and what's right. going on. Right. And we do some research and understand what those customer drivers and sentiments are and understand what those things are and look at the gap between what's been provided and what's needed. And often there's a big gap. Yep. One of the most interesting gaps that we've found is the extra services that these people would like. Yep. And that's interesting. When right? you say the extra service, you mean the clients? The clients, yeah. Well, oh, right. right. So you, you go to their client base and say, hey, what else would you like your advisor to pr provide? Yeah. So we've got a, that's a, a, good question. a series of tools, right? That's a really good question. Because I think there's so much there that advisors and, and the it's longer... It's really simple. They just have a part in the questionnaire that says, would you like to hear from the advisor? Yes. Yes. It turns out that every time that someone does that, there's something else that they want, need or a service that they require. Yeah. And you think, well, how long since you've heard from them? Two years? Yeah. Right. Right. You yeah. Know. That's awesome, man. Look, I think we could chat forever. So let's uh, book in you know, a couple of months from now. We'll do another one. But thank sure. you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. I, I learned heaps about, um, Jesus, a lot of stuff, including because I always wondered what Core Data did. Yeah, we're terrible at marketing. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's literally our greatest, one of the things that we're really busy, which is Excellent. good, right? But yeah. when I looked and look at how our marketing capacity, we're actually not very good at it. Oh, well. And I watch people who are really good at it and think, yeah, but their work's garbage. And that, yeah, so that's yeah. kind of interesting. I fully agree with that sentiment in general is is to just solve the problem and be good, like deliver the value and the marketing does itself. That's kind of my inner feeling. And then you just got to do some tweaking and some sprinkling over the top. Well, it, it is. I mean, there's a kind of interesting part of that. And I think every advisor is possibly in the same, same thing. There's this tension between... 
being the best business you can be for your clients yeah. and being the best business owner you yeah, can be. Yeah, definitely. So what we did about five years ago is we set a series of metrics around this. So cool. to be the best business that we can be, yep. this is what our cost should be doing. Yep. This is what our top line growth should be doing. Yep. And this is what our customers should be saying about us. And we do these surveys to customers so we know awesome. pretty, it's pretty clearly what they're saying about us. And if they fall outside of the, what people are saying about us, we go, well, what happened here? Yeah. And so sometimes we, we dig into it and we find out it's the client's fault. Well, that's ridiculous. That's unreasonable, right? That's right. A, you know, sure. insane yeah, to yeah, us for yeah. that. Um, and sometimes we find out that we missed a deadline or yep. we didn't communicate. Yep. Or, and we think, well, well, that's fair. And then yeah. we go back and have a little PIR and sit down and say, how did that happen? Yeah, the worst thing in business, I just, I hate, I hate more than anything is failing and getting things wrong. Oh God, I hate it more than anything, but it's an unfortunate, and especially if people get annoyed at you because you did something wrong as well, it's like, ah, it's just I, a I massive that, dagger through but the heart. You, you, I mean, one of the things I say to my guys, and, and some people really get that dagger through the yeah. heart thing, and I will constantly go back to them and say, if it's, I don't know you particularly well, but if, it's, if you were working for me and you had like one of those a year, you say, well, look, you're doing 100 events a year. Yeah. One a year is, that's normal, right? If yeah. there was 10 a year or 15 a year, we'd be having a different conversation. Yeah. How you handle this is going to be the definition of you, not that you repeat it, right? So yeah. let's handle this well and do a good job uh, and, and move forward that way. But yeah. if there's a repeated failure or if there's something happening. Yeah. So, for example, in our team, we've got a bunch of guys who just really love to please clients. Mm, excellent. They, they bug a profitability. Yeah. So... You that's why that either, when you right? said it's like you've got to be the best business owner and uh, the best business uh, deliverer as exactly. well exactly yeah so but you've also and it, we've got one guy who's doing it and we went back to the client and said we're just not earning enough out of this and they were horrified yeah they yeah. were like really well, we want to keep working with you well yeah. yeah i know i know that feeling so well now if there's any advisors that want to reach out to you or your company or anything like that how do they get in, in touch <laughs> via the website it's really easy it's just uh, there's a whole bunch of places to go into cordata.com.au and just send us an email and i'm really easy i'm just andrew at cordata.com com.au and I'll, I'll respond. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, my absolute pleasure. Cheers. Thank you.